Hey everyone, Michael B. The Game Genie here, and we're in the middle of Halloween Havoc, so today on Game Genie Review, we're going to be taking a look at a spooky game that I actually hated as a kid, but as an adult, I've grown quite fond of it, and I always seem to end up playing it right around Halloween. That's right, today we're taking a look at Castlevania II, Simon's Quest. So today we're going to be taking a look at Simon's Quest on the NES, a game perfect for Halloween and one I have become a very big fan of. Now while I enjoy the game very much personally, it is widely regarded as a bad or disappointing entry in the Castlevania series. Does this game deserve the negative reputation it has amongst retro gamers, or is it that it's just merely misunderstood? Castlevania is one of the most heralded series with retro gamers everywhere who tell tales of the cool bosses, great music, iconic gameplay, and legendary challenge. However, there is always one outlier when discussing the series pre-32-bit era, and that is the game we are talking about here today. Castlevania II Simon's Quest was released in North America in 1988, and was a direct sequel to the original entry, and gamers everywhere were clamoring for more Castlevania, which they got, but also kinda didn't get. Sure, the game retains several elements of the original game, such as the story, which was a direct continuation of the story from Castlevania 1, where we saw our protagonist, Simon Belmont, return to action to wield the vampire killer once more. After defeating Dracula in the original game, a curse was placed upon Simon, and the only way to undo the curse is to collect the parts of Dracula hidden in the mansions across the land, and once all have been collected, we must resurrect the Count and once again defeat him. Actually, that's a pretty badass narrative, so I can't imagine anyone has an issue with that. The music in the game is incredible and continues the tradition of this series producing some of the absolute greatest video game music of all time. Don't believe me? Then two words, bloody tears. So the music isn't the issue either. Is it the, what a horrible night to have a curse? No, I mean, that is one of the earliest instances of gamers having a day-night transition where the enemies get more difficult and creates a sense of urgency. I really dig that, so it can't be that either. Where the game strays from the original is in the gameplay itself, and while really inventive, not everyone was happy with some of the changes. The original game was a very linear experience where Simon would battle from one side of the screen to the other and reach a boss at the end before moving to the next screen. Simon's Quest did something extremely different. Instead of starting on stage one and going toe to toe with an army of ghouls and classic movie monsters, you start off in a town, and when you approach the first person you see, instead of combat, you enter into a conversation. Well. That's a way to start. Come on, we are going on an adventure! The game completely strays from the designated action platforming gameplay style the first game created and moves to an action adventure game with light RPG elements. We start in the town and just walk around talking to the villagers, hoping they can provide us with some direction on how we get to the action. You know, whipping ghouls, killing vampires, the family business. Unfortunately, nobody really says anything of value, or at least what they said could be helpful if it wasn't a riddle in itself. So you are in this massive open world adventure game with no direction on how to progress, and the only people you can interact with are incredibly cryptic. And see, this is why I didn't like this as a kid. This was a game I was just hopelessly lost in. I never knew where to go or what to do next. Young Mike 
hated cryptic games, and sadly, this game gets more cryptic as we go along. Thankfully, we live in a glorious technological age where information that once would only be found in a magazine if we were lucky enough to have it, or through a call to a Nintendo game counselor, is easily accessible through the power of the internet. With this knowledge at my disposal, I know that I have to buy a white crystal in the first town and I can upgrade my whip and buy holy water which will become absolutely one of the most important items in the game, but for the stupidest reason. Unfortunately to do so, you will have to buy these from one of the merchants in town, so that means we need cash, or weirdly enough, hearts to buy these items. Of course it's a heart. I mean in the first game you were collecting hearts to let you use your sub weapons, so of course hearts is something completely different in this game too, right? Why can't hearts be used to refill health? Well at least in this game, you can rest at a church to refill your health, which makes more sense than eating found meat. While collecting hearts you may also notice Simon will pause and your health bar will grow. Well the hearts collected also yield experience, and you can gain levels in this game. So let's get this straight. Open world to explore. Upgradable weapons that improve your attack stat. And you gain levels? Is this the first Metroidvania? In theory, yes, but a really early concept that at times is poorly executed. Like the leveling we just mentioned, for example. In any other Metroidvania game, you could stay in one place and farm for experience when leveling up, but of course it has to be complicated here, so you can only level up up to a point on certain enemies, and at certain places between mansions. I would love to be more clear about it, but even I don't fully understand it. Then when we have enough hearts, we go back into town, but where is the guy selling the whip? Of course, he isn't just somewhere you can see. No, you have to use the stupid holy waters to break false blocks that will allow you to find him and buy the whip upgrade. Purists will say, just throw the bottles at everything and explore, but I say, save yourself the headache, at least on your first playthrough, and use a guide so you don't miss anything needlessly. So we are finally ready to move on, and we go to the right, and with the help of our strategy guide, finally move off to the first mansion. The mansions are basically the dungeons of the game, like in a Zelda game, whereas there are towns and you normally progress across the overworld stages to get between them all. Make sure to equip that white crystal that we had to acquire in the first town because it will create a floating block that will let you actually progress in the mansion. Oh, did I forget to mention that unless you have the exact right item equipped at the exact right time, sometimes you are just stuck in this game. See, this is why I said treat yourself and use the strategy guide. As you start to progress through the mansion, eventually you will fall through some invisible blocks and have to traverse back up to where you were. The secret to not falling through the invisible blocks? Well, throwing the stupid holy waters. As you walk, you can do two things. Watch where the enemies walk and see if there are areas they won't cross, or throw a holy water and see if it breaks or goes through. Trust me, you will be doing this a lot. There are really two main objectives in a mansion, with the first being finding a merchant who will sell you an oak steak. The oak steak is necessary for the second part, which is finding the item room where you stab the item orb with the oak steak to possess the part of Dracula you came looking for. Or should I say, prozess. And yeah, that's it. No boss. You just stab it with your oak steak, collect your piece of Dracula. Pretty easy, right? Well, there is another complaint. This game isn't actually all that difficult. In fact, it's one of the easiest Castlevania games you will ever play through. Well, once you know what to do. The difficulty here lies in the exploration of the open world and learning what to do when to progress. As we move on to the next mansion, our white crystal gets traded for a blue crystal. This comes into effect as we reach a dead end that appears to be all water. Kneel down with the blue crystal equipped and a path opens to the next area. There are also areas like in the graveyard where we can drop a piece of garlic and a man will appear and give you a silver dagger. Then we have the ferryman, who will usually say something sly and take us to another town. But if we equip Dracula's heart, the ferryman will change his tone and actually bring us to the next mansion. Last but not least is this impassable wall. Of course, what we have to do is equip a red crystal, kneel down, and some weird whirlwind will appear out of nowhere and take you to where you need to go. I mean, how would you know how to do any of these things if it wasn't for a strategy guide? I would say that you need to decipher the clues given by the townspeople, but it's hogwash. People basically figured this out by throwing shit at the wall and seeing what's stuck. Eventually there are bosses like the Grim Reaper and this mass type thing, and if you don't know what to do, I'm sure they can seem extremely challenging. The truth is, they're really easy. The first option is to just walk right past him. Yeah, that's right. 
He's really an optional boss. In fact, there is only one boss in the game that you have to beat. But if you do want to face the optional bosses, you can beat them fairly easily, and they drop some cool items. With the Reaper, if you have this Fire Pillar item, you can pause death and just whip away until he is dead, and you get this amazing golden dagger that is super overpowered. The next boss is this weird mass thing. He shoots projectiles that can be difficult, but guess what? Equip Dracula's rib and stand still, and his projectiles can't hurt you. Stay still until he starts his circular patterns and then hit him with the broken dagger, and he will go down in no time. Finally, we hit the main event as we have all of Dracula's parts, we throw them onto the altar, and the Dark Prince is reborn. Is he going to provide that challenge that we have grown accustomed to from the first Castlevania? Nope. Hit him with the fire pillar to freeze him, and whip away, and that's the game. The end screen comes up, and you will notice that it's gray. That means I got the bad ending, which I usually do. This is because the ending improves depending on how quickly you beat the game. I like to take my time and enjoy the experience and make sure I get everything, so I am slow, but the game rewards you for getting better and finishing the game faster to get the best ending. So that is Castlevania 2 on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Is it a bad game, or is it just misunderstood? Me personally, I'm a very big fan, and every time I finish it, I come back clamoring for more. But I'm not oblivious to the many, and I do mean many, curious design choices in the game. One thing's for certain. Don't listen to anything you've heard because this game deserves a chance. It might not be your cup of tea, but maybe, just maybe, you'll get lost in the adventure and enjoy it as much as I do. Anyways guys, I hope you've enjoyed today's review. I hope you're enjoying Halloween Havoc. This is Mike to be the Game Genie, and I'll talk to you next time.